Excuse me, uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. And before I introduce our speaker for tonight, I want to thank everybody for coming. Uh, those of you for coming, uh, those of you who came last time, and those that are here for the very first time, really appreciate the turnout. And uh, been very surprised with how many people were were interested. Um, this week we have a very special speaker, uh, his name is Edwin Marshall, and uh, a lot of you probably know about Edwin has done a lot for not only the Creek people, but Seminole people as well, and uh, actually he's going to be running for one of our council positions in the, with the Creek Nation, so I'm sure you appreciate your support. Uh, the way this class came about was really inspired by a Facebook page that I joined called Muskogee Word of the Day. A lot of you are probably on that. And uh, really, it should be called Ask Edwin Marshall because <laughs> if anybody has a question pertaining to the language and the culture, and that's what really inspired me to start the class because it just got me to think and you know, wanting to learn more and, and I didn't know how many people would be interested in the Oklahoma City area and, uh, and so Edwin and, uh, and so Edwin has uh, actually motivated me to keep the class going I didn't know if we would have another class after the last time and he really encouraged me to, to keep the class going so I want everyone to Mr. Edwin Marshall Good old David. You still go? Good answer. I want to say a little story. Those of you that understand me, you'll uh, you'll know what I'm saying, but I'll I'll uh, translate it here in a minute. I'm going to say that I'm going to say that I'm going Over into a chorven, Kinsido. He's dear, Grandpa, as a Manachimbo Oxford, as a Manachimbo as a and you know, so many people when we see each other, we'll say, hey, Jay, or some of these new, uh, new age speakers, they say, hey, Jay, but it's a, uh, hey, Jay, but what that is, is a response. It's not a primary greeting. It, it, it says, I'm doing well. And when I said that to my grandpa, I said, hey, Jay, grandpa, I said, I'm doing well, grandpa. He said, I didn't ask you that. <laughs> I said, what? He said, I didn't ask you that. I said, what are you talking about? He said, first you say, Istungo. That means, is everything well? And then you say, all is well, which is his jay. And it, and it all of a sudden it made sense to me. I never did quite think about it like that, but my grandpa, he was a sage old man. He was a wise man. For those of you that may have known him, his name was Daniel Beaver, Chortke Beaver, very traditional man. He grew Half of his life, he was a tradition. He was a speaker at Alabama ceremonial ground. Then in the 1930s, he converted. He became a preacher, a Baptist minister. And he was a Baptist minister until he died in 1978. And uh, I was raised in his home. When I was born, I was taken from Talahina Hospital back to his home just west of St. Creek Baptist Church near Wetumpka. We lived in a multi-generational home. My mother was a single parent. But I had my grandparents. My mother only worked 20 miles from Wetumpka, and we lived six miles from Wetumpka, but because we didn't have a car, she had to stay with her sister in Wetumpka through the week. And 
come down to Sand Creek on a weekend. So I stayed with my grandparents. Some, when Sunday night came around and she had to go back to my Sunday aunt's night house. came around and she had to go back to my aunt's house six miles away so she could catch a ride to work. Man, I'll tell you what, it broke this little boy's heart. I would cry and cry and I just couldn't understand why my mom had to go away. But you know what? I didn't realize what was going on. It was it was actually a movement of God that I was being raised by my grandparents. My grandpa was bilingual. He uh, he was he spoke Greek fluently, naturally being a traditionalist and a medicine man. He spoke Greek fluently, but my grandma didn't speak one word. I never heard her say one sentence in English. She could say single words, you know, but she didn't bother to speak English. She didn't need to. All our neighborhood, all our community down there around Sand Creek, all Indian people. I grew up knowing just Indian kids. I never, I, matter of fact, I didn't see a black kid until I was about five years old. And we went to the store one day and I seen a little black boy. And it scared me to death. I've seen white people, but I've never seen black people. I told my grandpa, I said, Now you know how grandpa is that. He loves to go move, my guy. Black person, that's what that means, still It means black person. That scared me to death. There was black people. Not because there was anything wrong with them, I just didn't know what it was. I never heard of them. I had a lot of friends growing up when I was a little boy down in the country, and we spoke Greek. Oh, we, we, we was learning to speak English, but I primarily spoke Greek. That's what I spoke when I was growing up. And then when I got up, got to the social age of three or four, down in church, running around with other kids, of course, some of them spoke English, and I learned how to speak English. But my kid, my friends, they didn't have names like... Uh, usual names that you, James or Leroy or anything like that. I had friends with names like Nogosi, uh, Chobli, uh, things like that. Don't, don't, everybody so as I was growing up, um, we lived in the country, and uh, when I got to school age, my grandmother didn't want me to ride a school bus because it was cold outside. I had an older sister and a younger sister. She wasn't worried about them. She was worried about me. I was an only boy. And uh, you know how the many people are with only boys. She she had a home built in town in Wetumpka and we moved to town. And uh, until then, I couldn't speak much English. And my grandma, she taught me how to read and write Greek from a song book in the Bible. But she taught me other words too. And so it just made sense to me. All the words that we were speaking, written down on paper, Made sense to me. But then when we moved to town, we moved a block away from my other grandma. My other grandma don't no, have a drop of Indian blood in her. No, no, a drop of Indian blood in her. She's white woman. My dad was half white. And so she wanted to see me all the time. And so I would go down and visit her. And, and But if you knew my white grandma, I don't know if any of you knew Mandy Marshall. She was just white in color. That's all. She was a woman leader of the Indian Baptist Church. She could cook any Indian food you, you could put out there. And she spoke every word of Muscogee Creek. Her children, I don't know if you know the Marshall boys. Paul Marshall, Joe Marshall, George Marshall. All those Marshall guys, the deacons and preachers. They're all half white because of their grandma. I mean my grandma. But... When I went to visit my grandma, she said, you know what, I was four years old. I was reading and writing Creek, and she was amazed. She said, pulled out a newspaper, and she started reading to me. And when she was reading to me and showing me those words, I could understand it. I could see why those words she was saying made that sound with those letters. So she taught me how to read a newspaper so when I started school at six years old, I was reading and writing two languages. And uh, that's what I said a while ago when I said, I didn't realize how blessed I was that God saw fit that I'd be raised by my grandparents. Uh, I have a cousin here in the audience with this, Colleen. Colleen, uh, she was in the same situation. She was raised by her grandma. And I tell you, it's a blessing that we got raised by our grandparents, huh, Colleen? Yes, it is. Uh, I don't know. I, and you know, to me, that's what's wrong with today's society. We get these HUD homes and they penalize you for having multi-generations in your house. 
uh, they make you pay big rent or they make them move out. That's not Indian way. Indian way is we had our grandparents living there with us. That's how we learn things. That's how we learn our culture and that's how we learn our tradition. So, having said that, that's what my background is. I, uh, I always knew how to read and write Creek. I, I kept a little big boy. I don't know what happened in high school. But, <laughs> but anyway, I uh, went on and my grandfather was somewhat of a prophet. And uh, he used to tell me things. And we were talking about this last night in Alabama Stone Ground. I was telling a friend of mine, John King. He said, you know, your grandpa, he did a lot of things. And I said, I'm going to tell you something, John. He said, I said, he told me prophetic things that he was told. It wasn't him, but he was told some things. And I said, let me give you one example. I said, I came home from school one day, and grandpa said, Chibar, my husband was in that big school, you know, he said, when you go to school, there's a lot of white kids. Well, they were primarily white kids. I said, yeah. He said, but this is we don't go. There's a lot of Indians here, but mostly white kids. He said, there's bigger towns. Oklahoma City, Tulsa. That's a lot of white people. Hundreds, thousands of white people. He said, not many Indians up there. He said, but there's even bigger cities. He said, I've been there. I've seen it. He said, Los Angeles. Washington, D.C., Detroit, Michigan. He said, there are Detroit, Michigan. He said, there are no Indians. It's all white people and black people. And he said, I said, sure is. I said, lot more. He said, but I'm going to tell you something. He said, I'm not going to see it. I'm not going to see it, but you're going to see it. In your lifetime, you're going to see it. He said, the time's going to come when there's going to be more Indian people than there is white people. And those white people are going to go away. But in his mind, they were going to get back on a boat and go back to England. But I thought, I told Grandpa, I said, no way, Grandpa. There's no way. There's too many of them. Even where I go to school, there's too many. No, he said, it's been told already and it's going to happen. I'm just giving you an example here of, of the cultural ways. Last year, I was reading something and it was in the news. And it said by the year 2020, white people are going to be a minority. And you know, when I was a kid, there was no way white people could be a minority. But even what I didn't realize when my grandpa said the Indians are going to repopulate this world. We got a lot of Hispanics that are coming into the United States that they can't stop it. There's millions of them now. And when I came to think about it and realize that those people are Mayan and they're Incas and they're Indian people. Because a true Hispanic, a true Spanish person is a white person. But those people coming from Mexico, they're Indian people just like us. And our own tribes, we're repopulating. When I was a young man, Creek Nation had 20, 25,000 people. Today we're 78,000. We've tripled. Partly due to car tags and uh, stuff like that. But, uh, but still yet, you know, that's, I'm just telling you about the prophetic things that he told me. He told me a lot more than that. But it's, it's just a great blessing to have grown up in a situation like that. He told me one other thing. He said, Siobhan, there's going to be a day. And he said it in the language. He said, there's going to be a day when you're going to stand in front of your own people. All of them. He said, and they're all going to hear you talk. I was an 11-year-old kid. I, I, I That's the crap off. We were on a Greyhound bus somewhere between here and uh, uh, Okeechobee, Florida. And he told me that. He said, I'm telling you that. I don't know what you're talking about, Grandpa. I'm just a little kid that lives down here with Tuck, Oklahoma. That's before there was a Creek Nation. See, my Grandpa himself was a speaker. And he said it jumps generations, it skips generations. And I don't know if you all have ever heard that, but sometimes native traits, they skip generations. One day, Chief Perry Beaver asked me to speak before the tribe at inaugural. 
I, I, I speak a, a traditional speech. Very few people have that. Traditional speech. speech. Very few people have that uh, a gift for speaking traditional. And he heard me and he asked me, he said, I want you to speak that at our inauguration ceremony. And I did. And since that time, I've spoken that speech, Seminole Nation Day, to introduce the chief. I was standing in Horseshoe Bend, Alabama last year, speaking in honor of our ancestors. I was standing at, I believe it's called Fort Pike in Louisiana, down on the shores of the Gulf with the delegation from the Seminole Nation and the Seminole leaders asked me to say that speech over their ancestors. And I was very honored to do that. And then it hit me all of a sudden one day, you know what, that's what my grandpa was talking about. He said some very prophetic things to me. I just, I, I'm saying that to say that it's a great blessing to have these things, these cultural, traditional things and you know, the, the shame of it is, I probably didn't learn half of what my grandpa was trying to do. But what I do have, I'm very blessed with, and one of those is the ability to read and write and uh, speak Creek. I say Creek, it's Muscogee. It's not Creek. It's not Seminole. It's Muscogee. It's a Muscogee language from the Muscogee people. Creek and Seminole is a white man's word. Uh, they call us creeks just because we lived around creeks and they call them Seminoles just because it's a Spanish word for Cimarron. But we couldn't, we didn't have no R in our language, so we call them Cimarron, and which eventually evolved into Seminole. So we're all Muscogee. That, that uh, uh, designation of Creek and Seminole, that's a political designation. We are Muscogee, all of us together. So some of your Seminole, Mr. Cully Seminole, some of your creek, uh, but I just want you to know for the purpose of our language, there's no difference. You don't see a difference in our churches. When you go to church, Indian church, we don't say Seminole Indian church or Creek Indian church, it's Indian church. We sing the same songs, we speak the same language, we hear the same gospel. When we go to ceremonial ground, we don't we don't separate anybody and say, you Seminole sit over there or that's a Seminole ground. You can't go there. You're a creek. We don't do that. We're Muscovia when we're out there. There's no separation. And so, having said that, this language is a Muscogee language. If you notice when I, if you guys uh, follow my Facebook, Muscogee uh, Word of the Day, that lady that does the Facebook page, that lady that does the Facebook page, she put creek on there, but originally I started out and said Creek Seminole. Muscogee Creek Seminole Word of the Day. And so, when I, the, the way that we started that, uh, someone in Tulsa, a good friend of mine, an old family friend, uh, sent me a private message on Facebook one day and said, Edwin, I know you know how to speak Creek uh, and you can read and write. Can you spell this for me? I need to write it on a piece of paper. I said, sure. And I did. It was on private message. Two or three days later, they said, well, how about this? And I'd send it back. And that kept going back and forth, and all of a sudden, one day, that person said, have you thought about doing that on Facebook? Just because there's a lot of Creeks and Seminoles out there that I think they're wanting to hear the language. I was adding phonetics, because this person is not a regular speaker. I was spelling with phonetics, and this person said, I really like that, I can understand it. So, I said, you know, what do you think? Do you think people really want to see that? Yes, I know they do. So I started doing that. All of a sudden, my, my own friends on Facebook said, hey, that's great. I can read it, I can write it, and I can understand it by those phonetics. And so I started doing that for a while. And then a lady in Georgia, her husband's Creek, but they've been living in, not Georgia, Tennessee. They've been living out there for 30 health service. She's not even Indian, her husband is, but she started learning the language. And she started saying phrases back to me. Other people did too. There's even one guy that looked like Geronimo, Joe Wolf. 
<laughs> oh, that guy started sending me, Joe Wolf started sending me phrases and words, and I thought, my good God, that guy's good, you know? Somebody's taught him too. And then Joe told me one day, he said, I'm learning a lot off your Facebook. That encouraged me. But this lady in Tennessee said, why don't you let me build you a page specifically dedicated to the language? Muskogee Word of the Day. And I said, ah, uh, you think so? She said, yeah. What I was afraid of was spammers and people like that getting on there. And uh, we've been able to watch that. We've been, I have, and she and I both, we watch out and make sure that those people are legitimate. Today, we got 5,500 people on that Facebook page. And the hit has grown. People like some of you here that monitor that. I'm not able to put stuff on there every day like I used to. Boy, I used to do it every day. I was prolific. But there's so much on there. If you know how to use it, go to that photos tab and click it, and you'll get a whole list of words I've done over the years. Anyway, to cut that story short, I um, met David, Frank. I met a lot of you here. Some of you, to, before today, I never saw you before. Uh, and But I want to say this, though. I was inspired, not really inspired, I was inspired by not really inspired, I was inspired by my grandmother. But I, but it was further enhanced when they published the Muskogee Creek Dictionary. Did I bring it? Um, it's sitting back there. And, uh, oh, there it is. My wife Cheryl has it right there. And uh, it was uh, published, uh, well, it was put together by a linguist named Jack Martin. And, and uh, David introduced him while he was sitting in the corner. I never met him before today, but I admire that man so much for the work he put into it. As a matter of fact, I want to just give him another big round of applause. Thank you so much. He and, and some Indian people, a whole bunch of Indian people, uh, even though uh, uh, Miss Malden, uh, Margaret McCain Malden co-authored the book. There was a lot of work that went into it from a lot of people. Uh, and uh, it's as close to what my idea of uh, the, the perfect dictionary, uh, translation dictionary there is. There was an early edition in the 1850s or 60s, and it was the very first one. And it was done by a missionary and a translator. They did pretty good, but it's, it's very limited, very limited. And some of those words are antiquated. Our, word, our language has evolved somewhat. It's somewhat antiquated, and there's a lot of words and terms that are missing out of there that this is more complete, this dictionary in Muskogee Creek. Creek Muskogee. Shame on you, Jack. That's not Creek. It's Muskogee. <laughs> uh, but having said that, I was further encouraged by this book because when I opened it up and I got to reading it, it was everything that I understood. I'm... I'm sad to say that some of our tribes right now are doing some language. I, I encourage people to do to to perpetuate the language. It's, they're, they're veering away from a standard right here. I see some misspellings, misphrases, and things like that. I don't ever criticize anybody because I want people to keep trying to perpetuate the language. But I see those things, and I'm a little bit sad about that sometimes. But I'm afraid if I say something, everybody will say I'm criticizing. But I'm telling you, you can't go wrong with this book right here. I am ashamed to say the Creek Gift Shop sent me five of them and I left them at the house all ago. And I didn't realize until I got here. I thought some people may want to buy them, but I, I ran off and left them. I understand you can buy them online a lot cheaper than you can Creek Gift Shop. Though. Creek Gift Shop's asking 45 and they're, what, 25 Yeah, yeah, it can be. Yeah, yeah. The uh, as a matter of fact, this I think this paper uh, it it comes in several different colors because mine's a gray book, and uh, it, yeah. And so, uh, having said that, I'm I'm not a linguist per se. I'm just a speaker. I know what the rules are regarding the use of uh, 
certain things like vowels and consonants and things like that. And even at that, it's pretty complex. So imagine what a linguist knows. And meaning in our language that you just can't do it in English. Someone, sometimes somebody will say, "How do you how do you say this? How do you say English phrase?" And I'll tell them I, that. Facebook, you know, uh, I can't get them come to mind right now, but it was just a simple phrase somebody asked me the other day, and I said, "Actually, there's no." Uh, there's no translation for that because it sounds silly if I literally translate what you're saying. Another thing is greetings, happy birthday, happy new year, merry Christmas, no such thing. Or people didn't know those things. People are starting to make up things on Facebook. I see that. But unless it's universally adopted, to me it doesn't mean anything. I'm afraid to I'm I'm afraid to tamper with our language. I'm I'm not worthy. Let me let me say it that way. I don't feel worthy to tamper with our language. But some people are trying to make it words for happy birthday and this and that. You know, uh, tradition, our people didn't, they didn't recognize your yearly anniversaries of your birth. Or if they did, that's what it was called, just the anniversary of your birth. They didn't make the count back in the 1800s or 1700s. They just knew that they were born in the season of a certain moon. Having said that, I'm, I'm real quickly here. I know we don't have a lot of time, but I've got some things to hand out. I've got 22 coffees. If somebody would come pass these out for me. Uh, I stopped off at FedEx while ago and made some coffees. There's maybe more than 22 people here, but if you're here with a spouse or something like that, if you would share. And it's... And it's uh, it may sound simple to you, but it's the first pages are alphabet and a pronunciation. But this is this is very primary to our languages. If you're going to read and write our language and understand, the alphabet is very primary, and it's good to know the basic rules of our alphabet. The first one is pronunciation. So after we hand these out, I'm, I'm just going to go over this with you all right quick. It has been since I was a little boy. So today I just typed these down and ran, ran through them right quick. Uh, I'm, I'm, I feel confident enough in myself that uh, my grandma taught me how to say the alphabet. And then after I say them, then we're going to say them all together. But I want you to listen to me. And this is the way, and if you'll listen closely, Muscogee pronunciation. Muscogee pronunciation don't sound exactly like Greek pronunciation. So if you'll listen just a moment, starting with A. Ah, G, E, V, E, A, G, L, M, N, O, P, C, C, T, U. Those alphabets. There's, I think, a, a two less than the English alphabet. And we've got a couple of those that make a different sound than the English alphabet. And I'm going to go back over those from the top. There's, there's, there's even a way you pronounce them that's different than the English, even though it's spelled like that. A, of course, is ah, always ah. No variation. It never says a. It never says a. It always says ah. As in ayo, which is hawk. G. Did you notice I said that a little different than chi? I didn't say chi. I said chi. It's almost a G. It's almost a cross between a ch and a G. That's the Muscogee pronunciation. 
A, T, E, E, just plain and simple, E, as in weasel or sassafras. It means long. Next letter is Fi, Fi, as in Figi, heart. He, as H, he, as in Hushby, meaning rind or bark, peeling, skin. It's a little bit tricky, this one right here. It's, the English call it an I, but we pronounce it kind of halfway between an I and an A, an English A. It's I, I. Fi, he, I, as in laigida, laigida, is a dwelling place or a place to sit. Ki, listen closely, ki, I didn't say ki, I didn't have a lot of breath in that, I said ki, ki, as in kuwegi. Go wagging. Why does the first K sound different than the second K? There's rules for that too. And it has to do with consonants sitting side by side. When a consonant sits alone, it makes a hard sound. Like D or T. If it said the T sits alone, it's going to make a D sound. In this case, the consonant is sitting by itself between two vowels, so it makes the hard sound of go wagging. The first letter makes a soft sound of K. Kuwegi, which means quail. Li, as in ligoti, or warm. Here's another thing, too. I don't know, I'm, I'm not a linguist, so what do you call that when you combine the T and H to make a th? Um, they teach Fox, they call it a blend. Okay. Okay, there's no blend in the Creek language when you put two consonants together like the T and the H. They make their own sound, their own independent sound. Notice it says li got he. It don't say li got he. It says li got he. The T and H make their own separate sound. Li got he. Me, as in miski or summer. Ni, ni. That's not just me talking, that's the way you say it. It sounds like it's me talking, but it's not me. It's me, me as in me, which means night. O, O as in woko. P as in patko, meaning grapes. Here's the next one, here's the tricky one. Chi, chi, as in shuttle, meaning fish. I'm going to stop right here and I'm going to go over this one because this is very important. This is one of the two or three that's very important. When you blend the T and the H, as he says, you do that by putting your tongue, your tongue on your top teeth, on the front of your top teeth. That, say it. Tha. Tha. Notice that your tongue is touching your teeth. Tha. Tha. But with an R, it's similar. It's similar. But your tongue touches the roof of your mouth, not your teeth. And you let air out of the sides of your tongue. Okay, put your tongue on the roof of your mouth and feel the, the space on the sides of your tongue where the air can come out. Put your tongue there and say, sha, 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 For those of you that follow my Facebook page, I use a THL, sha, tlo, tlo. The only reason I do that because that's the way they spell flop, flocko, which is actually a flop, flocko. But uh, if, if you ever see me do that, the sound is actually sha. So this is something. This is something you got to practice. Sha, sha, sha. 
Put your tongue on the roof of your mouth and not your teeth. Shock, shock, shock. There's a hard word. Suizui. Suizui. Are you live on What's your name? Kissy. No. Yeah. Oh, okay. You look like something to me on my Facebook page. It, it, no, 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 it's a girl I know named Lila Garrett. She looks like her, is the reason I said that. Uh, she said something. Uh, I, what, that, there was a discussion about a word, and I can't remember exactly what it was. And now, this girl, I've known her for a long time. She's a social worker. She's not a traditional Indian. I don't know if she grew up in Tulsa or something. But we were discussing this word, and she comes on Facebook and says, Edwin, I suspect that that's a onomatopoeia. That blew me away. <laughs> you know what an onomatopoeia is? An onomatopoeia is a word that is somewhat descriptive by the sound. Like, maybe that's why they, it's named that way, because that's the sound that it makes. And we do have a lot of words like that. We've got a lot of words in the Greek language that are actually the sound of maybe an animal or an insect. This word right here, suizui, it means locust. You know, when you go out in the summer and those, they're just yeah. out there in the trees and that's the sound. Somebody replicated the sound by naming them suizui. So that's an onomatopoeia. I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> but we got a lot of words like that. We got a lot of words where uh, it's a description of the sound it makes, or sometimes the. Uh, I, I used to think wada means cow. I thought it was from the sound that they make. Wada. <laughs> Guess what? I learned cattle are not. They're, they're, they're not of our culture. We didn't know what cow was until the Spanish brought them. So since we didn't know what they were and we didn't have a word for them, we had to borrow their word, which is vaca. So Greek started calling them vaca. Because vaca sounded too much like something else. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm teasing you. No, no, but Greeks call them vaca. And I think Choctaws, they got a word similar to it too, or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. And it comes from the, the Spanish. Let's go back. We just. We, we, that way, since God made them. But what I learned was that that fled the invasion of the Europeans. They didn't want to look at those white faces. They went down south into the border. They said, I don't want to look at those people. We're not, we're not, we know what's going to happen. Uh, the Spanish saw those people and they said, you know, no, they're like Cimarron's, which in the Spanish means like a wild uh, cow or something like that, a Cimarron. And they call them Cimarrons, and they lived down there in Florida. But like I said a while ago, they couldn't they couldn't say that word because they didn't have an R in their alphabet. And well, no, that's not true. Uh, that's what they said. What are they what are they calling this? One of them said, Cimarroni is what you Something like Cimarroni. So for uh, you know, if you I don't know how many of you people. Know some uh, traditional speakers, first language speakers. A lot of us, we still say Shimaloni, Shimalonogi. But it evolved eventually into Seminole. So that never was a native word. And and actually, they just called that whole group of people that blended together down there, some part Mikasugi, part Seminole, some of them were black people that fled slavery. They all gathered up down there. And they called them all Seminoles, but for the most part, they were Muscogees. They were Muscogees, and a lot of them, you know, they still identify with some of their, even though they call them bands, 
that were originally the tribal cabins, you know. And so uh, uh, we're, 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 we're still, I mean, in my, in my mind and in my opinion, we're still Muscogee brothers, regardless of what our history did to us. There's a whole other group living in Texas called the Alabama Kashana that fled from the same thing and took their group down into Texas. Actually, they migrated way out into Texas near Mexico and came back and ended up in East Texas. Okay, beside where were we at here? Sato. Sui Sui. That one moment of Pia. Okay. T or that pronunciation is T. T as in Tuka, which means fire. Who? Mark that in out. I don't know how I got on there. I should have been in. Who, as in Tokuji, Tokuji, Uji, Uji is a uh, suffix, actually meaning what? Say it, Joe. Small. Small. Like Ibuji, Ishtuji, Poktuji. Every time you see that Uji on the end, that means little. This says Tokuji, that means little fire. Well, that's what matches our little fire. Little fire. Next word, next letter, uh, as in Nushki. Nushki, meaning belly or tummy. We, as in Wasko, or Waskoji. Wasko means chigger. And because they're so tiny, people call them Moscow Hill. And the last letter is Yi. Yi as in Yakpi, which means orchid. A couple letters to that, what well, looks like a V. Yes, you saw it used earlier at Puspi. Sasso, Puspo. That, 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 that's another one that we got to, you, you, you got to practice and you got to use repetition to keep that in your mind. That makes a short U sound, U-H, because the U itself always makes the U, U sound. Okay, I'm going to say these again, and I'm going to go over them, and I want you to say them with me, okay? Okay? Chi. O. P. C. C T U A I have to think very, very important in reading and translating language. Are you recording this for is this going to be available for anybody here? Yeah, it's going to be on YouTube. Okay, cool. So Hopefully. that, those, uh... <laughs> now let's go to the next page. I promise you I'll make uh, some examples of some translations. And this is where we're going to exercise the alphabet. And I said, because that's my favorite subject, and we was going to do it today, we was going to do translations about our food, okay? How many, let me ask a question, is anyone here not Creek or Seminole? You're not? Okay. Is, uh, and a lot of us say, man, I like your language, and, and the way that, 
there if it makes sense and I can understand it. I, I think that's just neat. I think it's, I appreciate you for having an interest in our language because I mean, even though everybody thinks that about the language, I think we got one of the most beautiful languages in the world. But anyway, I just wanted to, what tribe are you? Choctaw Cherokee. Choctaw, well, you know, we got a lot of similarities with Choctaw language, you know. And uh, that's, uh, I'm going to have a little break here and tell you something that there's two Indian guys, one was Choctaw and one was Creek, and they was comparing words because uh, they, a lot of them were saying, one of them said, uh, how do you say rabbit? He said, Chofi, Chofi. And he said, I said, you know, he said, Chofi, Choctaw guy said, Chofi. And he said, you know, we say almost like that. We say Chofi. And there was going on, there was a few more words because it's all Muscogee. It's a Muscogee root. So the white guy, I mean the creek guy says, okay, I used to say squirrel, and the Choctaw said, well, it's funny. He said, go ahead, I won't laugh. <laughs> <laughs> but the word is funny. That means squirrel. You know? <laughs> he said, how do, you say, how do you say squirrel? He said, well, it's funny. He said, now go ahead, I won't laugh. <laughs> so I had to go right there and tell that. You know, another, another interesting fact is our brothers over there, the Cherokee Nation. Their word is their the name for their tribe, even in North Carolina, has its base root in Muscogee language. They call themselves the, the English call them Cherokee. They call themselves Jalegi. You know why they call themselves that? Because when we saw them, we said there was Chalaki, which means a people with a language we don't understand. Chuloki. Chulokogi. Chulokogi Wapto. That means they have a language we don't understand. They, when we call them that, they call themselves Chalaki. The Greeks call us Chuloki, but we were Chalaki. And so then that word became Jalagi. And eventually, the white people called the Cherokee. So that's just another little interesting on that. And I want to give you another interesting fact. Did you know there's a Greek word in the mainstream English language? It's in dictionaries. Anybody know that? I put it on Facebook one day, last year, two years ago. You know, the Catawba trees with the big beans hanging down from them, and they get the black worms on them every year in the summertime. You know the trees I'm talking about? That's a Greek word. The original word was kanashpa. That's what we call it, kanashpa. But the English didn't have a name for that because that tree is indigenous to the United States. And so when they couldn't come up with a name, they said, let's call it what the Indians call it. Except they couldn't say kanashpa, they call it katoba. And it's in every dictionary you'll find. Catawba, it's a Greek word. So that's another interesting thing. Let's move on. Okay, let's start with the first word. O-S-A-F-K-E and a pronunciation Z-A-H-F and K-E. You know what? We're going to have a little bit of fun here. I want you to take that Phonetic spelling right there, the second one, and I want you to say that word for me. Huh? Exactly, Ozofki. That's how we say it. You guys heard the word Sofki. The actual Greek word is Ozofki. Okay? Next word, and let's, let's, Ozofki. It's a corn drink or a soup made of ground pearl hominy corn with a small amount of ash lye added during the cooking process. It's extremely coveted by the most traditional Muscogees, sometimes preferred after it's fermented. We call it sour soft cake. I can drink it like that, but I ain't, it ain't my best. <laughs> Everybody here had soft cake? Yes. Okay. By the way, just to help me with my expenses, if anybody's interested, I know it's hard to come by in Oklahoma City. I brought some bags of soft if you want to buy some after the show. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> I got some lye too, by the way. Okay, next word. Let's go to the next table, young lady. I want you to look at that phonetic spelling and I want you to say the word. It's easy.
It's the one written in pencil. It's still coming. It's still coming. E, that's an E, not a H. Yeah. Iso Homa. Iso Homa. That's ash light. Ash light is made by pouring boiling water through a draining pan over hardwood ashes. It's used in the preparation of soft gear lyso. Does anybody here not know what ash light is? Has everybody seen it? You don't know what it is? Grab it to her. I mean, I'll show it to everybody. Show it. I'll show it to you. I make ash light. I make a musky. I make every, a lot of stuff. But anyway, but it's very corrosive. It's very corrosive, even though we use it in our food. You only put a couple of uh, ta uh, tablespoons in your soft. You don't put much in there. This is the same stuff we put in live soap. If you dropped a quarter in there and let it sit about three days, that quarter be gone in three days. That's how corrosive it is. <laughs> Jeremy here, he grew up eating that stuff, man. I'll tell you, down there, <laughs> down there in Middle Creek. Yeah. Yeah, you pour boiling water over hardwood ashes, and uh, what drains out at the bottom, that's it right there. Very corrosive, but it's delicious and soft. Okay, next word. Uh, <laughs> Colleen, no fair, no fair. I, I'm not going to you on that one. Let's go to this table right here. A busky. A busky. Okay. It's a drink made from parched corn prepared through a special process. Cheryl, would you give me that bag that's opened already? Prepared through a special process. Finding ground How many of you know what a busky is? But it's to die for. Now it's the best. My grandma made it when I was growing up. My aunts made it. I watched them make it. And they do it this time of the year, right now. In the pot, they go and pick field corn, not when it's already dried and hard, but it, when it's still supple, but it's too hard for roast ears. They take it and they shuck it. And they take that corn, they take that black pot, put it over a fire. They put hardwood ashes in there. And they put that shuck corn in there. And they take a wood paddle. And they stir it, stir it, stir it. Till that corn cooks to just the right color and consistency. Then they take it all out and they dust it all off. I'll show them. Take that bag and just start here and just pass it around. Don't you just smell the bag. You don't even have to open it. That's what that is right there. That's the meal. And uh, it's, it's, you mix it with sugar and water, ice water, if you want. It's the best stuff you ever had. I got some mixed right now back here on the table. As soon as I finish here, I want everybody to get a sample of it. Okay, while y'all are passing that around, let's move on. Uh, next word. Uh, Colleen, I'll let you have this one, okay? After a musky. Uh, Sakuniki. What does it mean? By the way, did a good job. It's one of our staple diets, staple foods of Muscogee people, pre most of them. And the Choctaws call it, uh, what do they call it? Oh, we're talking about Poshopa. Yeah, Poshopa. Yeah. Uh, chicken sauce, Choctaws, chicken. Uh, but uh, originally made it, but it sure is good. I'm glad we found it. Okay, this one's a little bit tougher, but I'm going to uh, I'm going to ask this lady sitting right up here in the red. I want you to say that next word. Look at the phonetic. The phonetic makes it easy. Say it again. Pascuaki, you said it perfectly. Pascuaki. It's great dumplings. We got some on the table back there, I think. Did you make that too, Joe? All right. Great dumplings, traditionally prepared from wild possum grapes. Uh, you take flour and mix it with the grape juice, make little dumplings, drop those dumplings back into the boiling grape juice that's been thickened. 
and when it's got sugar in it, it is delicious. I'm gonna have some more after I get through here. Okay. Uh, Have I been to your table today? I'm going to hate their The next word. Double egg something more key. Just like it smelled there and just like phonetics. Double egg something more key. She's been up for two days at the Green Corn in Alabama making double egg something more key. <laughs> I went by there yesterday. Combining dalegi bread and shamuthi, which means fried, meaning fried bread. We got some back from the table, too. Chattahava. Ah, I messed up and said the word, didn't I? <laughs> Chattahava. It's a boiled bread or corn cake made by adding blue coloring, or otherwise called ishwalatiska, and a small amount of ashlai to cornmeal and water, then formed into patties, which are then boiled. How many of you have seen Chattahala? You know what it is? Okay. It's delicious. You know, everybody's different Indian foods that I love. People say, I don't know how you like that. I can't stand it. I don't care if it's even a busky, Chattahala, Sakwanipki. I don't know because I wasn't taught to like that stuff. I grew up on it. I never have tasted it. Some people say it's an acquired taste. I acquired it when I was born, I guess, or when I was about six or eight. It's a blue food coloring additive. And to ash. And it's a, then it's finely crushed into a powder. And typically you add that to cornmeal to make chattahaka. You add that to the cornmeal and water, a little bit of ash oil, mix it together and make these patties to make sure make sure patties blue uh, you know Choctaw's got a dish but they don't put the coloring in there but it's a banana right the corn the little corn yeah biscuit thing yeah it's the same thing as banana but we put coloring in ours Choctaw's don't next word oh man when March comes around we all know what this is Joe what's that say Wild onions gathered in early spring, cleaned, cut up, and smothered in a frying pan with bacon drippings and salt. That's the way I like to cook it anyway. Some people, some people boil it water. I, don't, I mean, to each his own, but I like mine smothered in itself because it has water and it, it smothers itself. It's delicious. And the last word I'm going to put up here, there's a lot more foods, but this is all I have. Uh, just wanted to discuss today. Cured salt pork, typically sliced thick, parboiled and fried. It's the perfect meat accompaniment to wild onions or double edged salt wolf tea or just anything you want to fix. It's delicious. I'm going to uh, I'm going to leave these with you. I, I, I have this copy right here. Does anybody want this copy? Anybody want an extra copy? Uh, these are just examples of how we use our language and some of the foods that we use. Uh, it, as you're sitting here and as I'm talking, has there been any questions, any any thoughts that you might have had while we were talking uh, that you might be wanting to mention or ask? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, I, if I ever look at some of the Greek words, I always, always see a long, lengthy word, and it's hard for me to grass if they were if they could have been divided up a little bit they would have uh, put dashes in between or whatever just divided up a little it's a little easier for me to understand if it's divided up. that's why i do phonetics yeah that's why i do phonetics because i break it up into syllables that one word that i put on there is a where was it so easily mm -hmm. if you read it one syllable at a time you know we've got other words that are very complex. Halanjilabuki. That's a big long word. Halanjilabuki. That means going out backwards uh, or uh, backwards. Um, coming out backwards. 
of unsuitable people. It kind of sounds funny when you say it, but it's, a, it's, it's an actual word. If you were to see it written down, it'd be hard to read, but unless it was broken up like you're talking about. That's why when I, when I do my lessons on Facebook, I like to use syllables, because I can understand. If there weren't any syllables, it wouldn't hardly make sense to me. Sometimes I can't read some people's Greek writing uh, unless I break it down like that. It's, it's, yeah, and every language has, you know, just like English, they got words like, oh, no, I'm in a pew. <laughs> Jack, have you got any comments, by the way? No, I think this is fantastic. Keep going. Yeah. I am I am <laughs> And yeah, what time is it? 7.30. Uh, 7.30. Oh, I'm sorry. I, what I wanted to do is I wanted to take some of this abuski and I wanted to share with you. I've got some cups. I'm going to let you name your own poison because I brought some Splenda and some sugar because there's diabetics. I'll let you sweeten it yourself. But I want you to tell me if it's just not about the best stuff you ever had in your life. Uh, I, I love it. Um, and uh, the last time I was going to come, and I do want to apologize, I had a blowout and uh, ruined the tire. And I was afraid to drive up here on that donut, and then that very weekend, my wife Cheryl had appendicitis. We were in Midwest City. We were right over here in Midwest City, but she had surgery uh, that weekend as well, so we didn't get to make it. And I wanted to, I know I explained it on Facebook, but just so uh, I had softy ready. I remember that pop picture? Uh, cooker full of soft I'm going to say something, and I will translate in December. But if someone figures out what I said, they can tell us what I have said. And that's your second thing. I'm going to say a sentence and end it. Okay. You guys can hear me now? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Can you see me now? No. <laughs> I said, I'm going to say a sentence and I will translate in December. But if you can figure out what I have said, you're welcome to tell the rest of it. Okay. One more time. background himself. He's a nephew of Spencer Frank, a man that I highly regarded. Uh, very fluent speaker as well. Yeah. I brought something today that I want to share with you all and I just, uh, it's something, it's a piece that I bought and I've never used it. It's been hanging up for all this time and it's a Muscovy Gorget. Gorget, whatever you want to call it. Uh, it's a smaller piece. I've got some newer ones that are bigger, and uh, but it was made by uh, Charlie Thompson. He's a similar metal artist, and I. I also, guys, that uh, when David first mentioned about doing this, I thought, man, that's great. But, we got a lot of people up on the city. And they, they love our language and they know they know about our language. And I know that they want to see, they want to see it keep going on. Uh, I had an uncle that lived in Oklahoma City for years, uh, for well most of his adult life. 
and they went to church and, and they had church services up here in houses trying to keep the songs and the language alive. His name was Sammy Yorji. They called him Tubby. Uh, him and I don't know how many of you knew Tubby, but him and George uh, Bunny, they lived right over here, right off May Ave uh, right off May Avenue. And uh, but anyway, uh, having said that, uh, David, I don't know how, but I want you to take your finger and run it up and down and find somebody to okay. win this prize. Uh, well, did everybody sign in first of all? Yeah. I okay. I don't think I did. Alright. I have a triple yeah. tier voice. Yes, ma'am. Is that a piece that a man would wear? Or is it a piece that a woman would wear? Well, typically traditionally it was a warrior. It was a warrior thing. And it was it was one piece. It was one piece, but uh, royalty. You, now they make them up to three piece. I have a three piece gorget, and that typifies a, a uh, like a chief or something like that. But uh, in modern times, of course, our people. This is this is older Muscogee. Our people don't. It, they, it's not a ceremonial piece anymore like it used to be. But back. 150 years ago it would have been uh, but what it was is that originally originally these weren't metal they were made out of shell and they were worn by warriors and it was a single tier gorget and it wasn't jewelry when it came time for battle they cinched up that leather thong and it went right there that's to keep your enemy from cutting your throat when they cinch it up, and then after battle, they'd hang it back down loose. So, I have a I have a triple tier gorget at home. I've got two of them that I wear sometimes, like with my ceremonial shirts or, or my uh, traditional shirts. But yeah, in it, that's that's what the origin of it is. But anybody wears them anymore. A lot of people wear them. By the way, I do want to say, man, now that I looked at you. Some of you I've never met before, but we know each other on Facebook. I just want to say hello. It's good to meet all of you. Yeah. Joe, David, Kissy. Is there another group coming in here when we get done, Dave? Uh, no. Okay. So, have, have you figured out how to do this? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, All right, uh, Edwin, uh, we had 22 people sign in, so I'm going to have you just pick a number between 1 and 22. Okay. Number 9 is Jamie Russell. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, that, that concludes anything that I had ready. And like I said, does anybody want this other?